it's okay. yours. Yep. Va bene, so Italians, buonasera or buongiorno everyone. Uh, Italians uh, would start any sentence or anything they want to say with allora, which literally means uh, then or well then. Uh, it's just a way of starting a sentence. You may have heard it in the movies or if you've been to Italy. And uh, uh, so as Kelly mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a tour guide in Rome and the Vatican City State uh, uh, licensed, meaning that there are these serious exams to take. So I hope I'll be able to share uh, my love for Rome with you. And that one day, well, we'll see each other in Rome, actually, or again on Zoom or um, uh, however we prefer. So what I have uh, prepared, uh, for you is this um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, which I have to click on some important buttons here. So uh, it's called, well, Panoramic Tour of Rome. And um, for those of you who haven't been to Rome, I really wanted to start with the map uh, that uh, may help. Rome is a big city, uh, doesn't have skyscrapers, <clears throat> but mainly lower buildings. It's simply this European style and then the historical center is under protection, so we can't just build these skyscrapers. So that means it's quite spread and about um, between three and a half and four million people. But what we see here in front of us, this uh, um, orange circle, that's, the, that's say about a couple of million, three million people. Well, the actual historical center is uh, what I'm pointing out with the mouse here, right in the center, it says Roma. These lines uh, are the railway station, terminal railway station. The river is the river of Tiber, which Italians call Tevere. And uh, uh, here is the Città del Vaticano, the Vatican city-state. And uh, I would like to get closer to the historical center. So basically what we see now is where approximately one million people live. And we see a little better uh, the Vatican city-state. See this oval here? Uh, is the St. Peter's Square. We will get there uh, later during the tour. What we're going to do is uh, uh, we will enter from the northern gate. Uh, can you all see the mouse, uh, Carolyn? Is that all right? Yes, I can see it. Can the other okay. folks? If there's anything I can hear you will tell me. So here is uh, uh, Piazza del Popolo, People's Square, that has always been the northern gate to Rome. And uh, if you look at the uh, urban planning here, Wherever there are regular streets, like the grid of streets, uh, uh, that's some modern urban planning. Uh, because if you go slightly uh, towards the center of the map, you see that's kind of chaotic and the streets are medieval alleys when the local lords were building uh, as they liked. But uh, uh, of course, those are now shabby, chic, expensive apartments. But where you see um, urban planning, that's what we would call modern times, and that would be as a Renaissance. It's been about 500 years. So um, this is the, the trident, the so-called trident. And the street in the center of the trident, I'm dragging my mouse, is uh, Via del Corso, the main street, that goes here to the very center of Rome, which is Piazza Venezia, Venice Square. And the ancient Rome, the one that you've seen in so many uh, movies uh, or postcards, or maybe you've been, uh, is here this green area is ancient Roman, Roman Forum, uh, which was practically a sort of a Facebook for ancient Romans or Fox News, or that's where they would come to discuss politics and perform religious services. Then uh, these red M's uh, are the metro or subway. And uh, here is another... Uh, oval which is Colosseum. We'll get there too. And uh, across the river uh, from, from the northern square we'll go along the main street. We'll uh, visit the Spanish Steps, the fashion district. We'll go to Via Veneto where you see Ludovisi. Ludovisi was one of the family is it had the Pope in the family, which helps a lot with the real estate. In the former palace uh, uh, of the Ludovisi family, there's the American embassy today. So very elegant part of Rome. We'll go to the Trevi Fountain. Uh, we'll throw the coin virtually so we can all come back to Rome. And uh, from the Trevi Fountain, I will take you here, I'm dragging my mouse, towards where it says Borgo Big Roma. There is a square, fascinating square, with ancient Roman baths, 
turned into a basilica by uh, Michelangelo. I will explain that terminology as well later. They will go down uh, Via Nazionale, National Street, will go to the main square, Piazza Venezia. Uh, we'll go to the Capitol Hill uh, to see the ruins of ancient Roman Forum, the best view ever. Uh, we'll go to the Colosseum, we'll pass by, see this big, it's not green, uh, it's kind of sandy. Uh, that is the Circus Maximus, the, what used to be the stadium for chariot races. And then uh, it's just a big empty valley uh, today. And then we'll cross the river and we'll go to uh, Trastevere, where Tevere is the name of the river or Tiber, and Tras across. So this part of Rome uh, um, has always been a kind of shabby, but now it's shabby chic. And uh, uh, just kind of like Greenwich Village, uh, sort of. Uh, most expensive real estate. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at a few of those interesting buildings. And then we'll go up on the hill right here uh, called Giannicolo for the view of all of Rome. From there, we'll go down to the Vatican city state. I'll take a look at the St. Peter's Square. And we'll uh, wrap up everything with Castel Sant'Angelo, the castle of the angel. We are also going to uh, visit briefly the Piazza Navona, the beautiful, beautiful square um, famous for the fountain of the four rivers, four river gods, and it was featured in the movie Angels and Demons as well. And here where it says Pigna, uh, that is the neighborhood of the Pantheon. So we're going to take a look at that amazing ancient monument as well. So that's the large, larger historical center of Rome. I just wanted to give you some idea about uh, what we will be doing. So what we'll try to uh, squeeze into 45 minutes is how we got from this to this. Uh, it's been uh, 3,000 years, they say. And uh, uh, the she-wolf uh, uh, is a mythological uh, creature who raised the, the twins, uh, Romulus and Remus. You see the little guys here. Uh, they're actually Renaissance, they're about 500 years old, added to this statue of a she-wolf, who Romans like to believe is ancient Etruscan, but some killjoy German archaeologist recently said it was only medieval, uh, which makes it 12th century, so that's not that good, but it's still good. So the she-wolf, the, the mythological, um, uh, not really the mother, obviously, the, their mother, according to the legends, uh, was uh, a Vestal Virgin and the father of the twins was God Mars. So we have a really good family lineage there. Of course, Romulus killed Remus, so we are in Rome and not in Rome. So we have uh, uh, ancient history of the kingdom and then of Republic with the assassination of Julius Caesar. We have this transition towards the empire uh, stretching between uh, um, practically England, all of Europe, Middle East, North Africa, and then the fall, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the beginning of the Dark Ages, Middle Ages. Uh, the fall was due to many factors, also barbarian invasions, but climate changes, economical crisis. And uh, uh, what emerges from the ruins of ancient Rome uh, is the church. Peter dies in Rome and uh, uh, Rome becomes the capital again, but this time of the Christianity, later the division and becomes the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, the palace that you're looking at is now a museum, Doria Pamphilia, uh, one of the papal families. I told you having a pope in the family helps a lot with the real estate for generations. The family is still around, they run this museum beautifully. So this is Rome. Uh, today, what we were looking at, this big green field here is the, the Gallery Borghese, uh, the park, that was also owned by a family that had a Pope in the family. Uh, we see the Colosseum here, all is clearly visible, but uh, um, rarely seen is the part that actually collapsed in a big earthquake in 1348 and then continued uh, crumbling to leave us with this magnificent, impressive uh, ruin. And this is Circus Maximus, this big green field. Remember um, Ben-Hur, obviously, 
Charlton Heston, who could forget that. And then uh, the green hill here with some ruins, that's the Palatine Hill, that's where Rome was founded according to the legends. And uh, uh, the big white uh, monument here in the center of Rome, that's the main square, Piazza Venezia, which we're going to see. And this is the, the river of Tiber. So uh, we'll be starting here from the north, following the main street, Via del Corso, and so on for the, the rest of the panoramic tour. So what is considered historical in Rome has something to do with, well, history. You see this red line that goes around the city center that we just saw? Uh, that's the Aurelian Wall, built in the third century by Emperor Aurelian with the intention of preventing the barbarians uh, from entering the city of Rome. And who were the barbarians? Were basically northern European tribes searching for warmer climates. And they plunged on, on Rome, their future Europeans, Americans, practically the Western Hemisphere. And this is the Aurelian Wall today. Two thirds survive out of 19 kilometers or 13 miles. Uh, two thirds survive and they have been fixed up and uh, redone, restored, but the walls are still there. So third century AD. And here is the Northern Gate. We are entering the city. We are greeted by this amazing obelisk, ancient Egyptian. It's so much older than Rome itself. It goes back to the 13th century BC. Uh, Romans conquer Egypt in the first century BC and they bring whatever they like <laughs> to, to Rome. And they also made a lot of these themselves, uh, frequently without hieroglyphics, but sometimes with, uh, with those as well. So this obelisk wasn't here originally. There are more than 30 on the streets uh, of Rome and uh, we lost them during the Middle Ages. They fell, people knocked them down, they were afraid of the hieroglyphics. The popes found some of them and practically repositioned them to serve as a sort of a GPS for the pilgrims. So this is the first obelisk the pilgrims would see, uh, searching for the tomb of Peter. There's a cross at the top, I chopped it off a little bit, but it's there. And then from there, there were straight streets, uh, where the obelisk with the cross is always at the very end. So the pilgrims could see them uh, without all of this urban growth. And these beautiful sort of twin churches, they're not mm, exactly identical, but they're identical enough. So this is the beginning of the, of the main street here in the, in the center, in between. To the right is the street that leads to the Pantheon and Piazza Navona. And to the left would be the third street of the Trident leading to the Spanish Steps, to the Fashion District. So this is just a slightly different uh, view of the Piazza del, del Popolo. And now we have arrived to the middle of the main street and turned left or east. And we're looking at the famous Spanish Steps. Uh, the street leading to the Spanish Steps is Via Condotti. And uh, I'm sure some of the ladies have already noticed, hmm, there's Prada on the left, there's Gucci to the right. That's some sort of a rodeo drive of the situation. All the designers who respect themselves have their shops there. And uh, Via Condotti actually comes from the conduits uh, because uh, uh, they were part of the ancient Roman aqueduct. There were 11 major aqueducts in Rome, but only one survived into the Middle Ages. And so the steps are called Spanish because of the vicinity of the Spanish embassy to the Vatican, to the Holy See officially. And the top of the, of the steps is a church of the Holy Trinity and an obelisk. So the second one on the pilgrim's route. And uh, it was visible from the Northern Gate 500 years ago because all those buildings were not around. So pilgrims would arrive to the Church of the Holy Trinity and then a straight street would lead them towards um, southeast, the Basilica of St. Mary uh, Major. So that's Piazza di Spagna, which is normally full of people, but this photo was taken a few, few days ago. It's not, it's not crowded these days, but hopefully it will be. So turning to the right, not going up yet, uh, there is uh, the Spanish flag and the army unit in front of the Embassy of Spain to the Holy See with the column of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, uh, the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church 
Mary was conceived free of original sin. The dogma issued in 1854, and there is a beautiful statue of Mary at the top with the prophets from the Old Testament uh, at the bottom of the, of the column. This is Via Veneto. Now we jumped uh, to the top. It's beautiful, beautiful architecture, mainly late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, this is the American Embassy, Palazzo Margherita. Margherita was the queen. Uh, Italy was united in 1870, a very young country. You know, in the chaos of the Middle Ages, the Pope emerges uh, uh, powerful, not just spiritually, but uh, uh, in a lay sense of the word. And uh, there were the so-called Papal States and the fragmented little bits and pieces of the peninsula, united in 1870. And the royal family was from Piedmont, from the north. And uh, the second king of Italy, his wife was uh, Margherita. You probably mentioned her more frequently than you may recall, because uh, uh, there was um, this, there's this little story about the queen visiting Naples and a little pizza yolo, a pizza maker, uh, wanted to do something in honor of the queen. And he only knew how to do pizza. So he made the pizza. No, and he used the, the ingredients and colors of Italian flag. So he used mozzarella, tomatoes, and basil. Et voila, we have pizza margarita. Whatever the queen had to say about it. Now, there are other legends how she loved it so much. She would escape to Naples to have a slice of pizza, things like that. Maybe, yes, maybe. That's why Palazzo Margherita, but once upon a time, it was the Palazzo of the Ludovisi family. And then the Trevi Fountain. Uh, the gorgeous fountain, there's always been some sort of a fountain uh, at this location. Uh, this is the only aqueduct that survived into the Middle Ages. Those nasty barbarians cut the aqueduct during one of the sieges. And uh, the way it looks today, the Trevi Fountain was designed by Niccolò Salvi in 1735. I won't be telling you many dates, but just some that may be interesting because Trevi Fountain is, is so famous. And uh, thanks to the song, Three Coins in the Fountain and good old Frank Sinatra, the school craze started about throwing a coin into the fountain, like uh, wish well, wishing well. Well, you know, I visited Rome uh, in 1980s as a tourist. I probably dropped a whole wallet into the fountain and uh, here we are. That was, it was a good investment, but uh, uh, you may also make a wish. Now we can stop for a couple of seconds. Imagine a wish. Hmm, and throw that coin down the drain, and it's done practically. Keep me updated. So now, um, we went more east uh, towards the railway station, and uh, here is what I mentioned as a basilica. You see those ancient walls, they go back to the third century, the enormous thermal baths built by Emperor Diocletian for 3,000 people. In the Middle Ages, they become ruins, uh, and uh, uh, Michelangelo was commissioned by the Pope to transform those ruins into a magnificent basilica. There it is. Uh, Michelangelo used uh, whichever wall was still there, uh, surmounted it by the cross vaults. Uh, some of the columns are original from the third century, some are concrete, uh, painted to look like granite. And uh, it's an absolutely stunning space. Michelangelo has nothing to do with any decorations, but just with architecture. Just imagine he was a sort of a um, fixer-upper in this case. Inside the basilica, there is this meridian that comes after Michelangelo, 140 years later, 120, 30 years later, 1702, because Michelangelo finished the project when he was 86. Uh, so that was his last architectural project. He died when he was 89 in 1564. And now 1702, Meridian. What does the Meridian tell us? You see, I took this picture. It was uh, the end of June. And there was this uh, uh, little light. And there's a cute little crab here. Well, uh, if you look to the right of the crab, more up, there's a lion, Leo. So uh, here we are at the Meridian. Uh, let me start my little time lapse. This will be just... Uh, one minute, it took 10, 10 minutes, but it will be just one. Uh, when it's noon on the Rome meridian, uh, then the beam of light, the sunshine, hits the meridian. And when it's right on the meridian, meridian itself, uh, it tells us exactly also in which constellation uh, the sun rose this morning, and not only that it's uh, noon at the meridian. 
So uh, from the day I was born, sun rose in the constellation of Gemini. So I'm Gemini. That's how that's how that goes. Well, it's a fascinating, fascinating building. Okay, so let me go. Now towards Via Nazionale, I promised the National Street, the first modern street laid out in Rome. We are talking about the late 1800s. That's why National, Nazionale, it's quite political. And at the far end, you see that enormous monument, Vittorio, <clears throat> Vittorio Emanuele, the first king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel II, uh, had his son Umberto actually built the monument dedicated to his father. So uh, this is Piazza Venezia. This is the beautiful Piazza Venezia, Venice Square, with the statue of Victor Emmanuel uh, in the middle of the monument with two four-horsed uh, carriages, symbol of the triumph in ancient Rome, with the winged lady who inspired that swoosh on Nike tennis shoes, so the goddess of victory. And this is a historical photo. So uh, when we were talking about um, giving you a chance to maybe ask some questions, there was this idea to maybe stop here at Piazza Venezia for a couple of minutes and see if there are any questions. I don't know, Carolyn, if you can read the chat, if there's any, anyone. Yeah, we have um, no questions in the chat, but uh, we have 53 participants. So um, hmm. if you, I can, if there's Let's anything see. That if, should... if someone wants to ask a question and unmute themselves, we'll try that. I think you have us all in your thrall, Olga. <laughs> um, Maybe there will be time later. Just want to sure. Do... Yeah. Thank you very much. Talk your ears off. <laughs> all right. So yeah. This oh, is... you know what? I see a number one in the chat. Hold, please. Please. Where is the piazza on the map of Rome? It's right in the very center. And uh, um, I really don't know how to go back now and do that. This is one of my, my first zooms. But, uh, in that map of Rome, mm -hmm. um, if anyone, Carolyn, please, you can also um, ask if people would like me to send them something, some photos, I would be, I would be happy after the presentation. Specific questions. And if there's anything on the map, beat where is this or that or any other question i would be happy to to answer at uh, any time after the presentation wonderful uh, i will put my address in the chat and people can um ask sure. absolutely anytime later i'm not going to disappear and you never heard about me <laughs> i'll be there so it's right in the center of that map it's practically between the main streets it goes for about a mile from the northern square and then the main square, this one. And now you will see uh, behind the Piazza uh, Venezia with the big monument that's more famous, uh, also known as the wedding cake. You've probably heard about that. The wedding cake because of too much whipped cream. Uh, also because this new royal family was not very much loved in Rome. So whatever they did wasn't good. And it's only 100 years old. So that doesn't qualify for anything in Rome. But let me give you a better idea. Maybe now we're going to go to on my screen and yours to the right, to the Capitol Hill. And then from the Capitol Hill, we'll have the view of ancient Roman Forum and the Colosseum. And then we'll go back down to Piazza Venezia and then to the left and follow uh, the ancient ruins uh, Imperial Forum. When I say forum, I'll tell you what, what that really means. Uh, basically the same way as we use it, use it today. But uh, again, first, We'll go now to the right, to the Capitol Hill, to look at the ancient Roman ruins. And then we'll come back to the square and pass by the column of Trajan and go to the Colosseum. So let me go to the Capitol Hill. The way it looks today, it was redesigned by Michelangelo. So the first uh, modern planning uh, after the Middle Ages, along with the trident, more or less same time, we're in the 1500s. We have this very gentle raising uh, uh, staircase towards the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, the building with the bell tower was the first the state archive, uh, actually Republican state archive and then Imperial 2000 years ago. And then there was the medieval Senate on top of it. And today it's a town hall. 
uh, the town hall. And then to the left and to the right uh, are the buildings that were senatorial uh, in the papal times when Pope was the, the king of his own state, but the local barons wanted to have their own senate as well. Like in the empire, there was emperor and the senate. And uh, uh, these are now the Capitoline Museums. Amazing, amazing museums. And here is a statue of Marcus Aurelius. The original is in the museum. We're now right behind it. And uh, uh, this is a replica because the weather conditions uh, damaged the statue in you know, 2000 years. The only statue, equestrian statue that survived the Middle Ages when anything made of bronze was melted down for weapons and utensils, he survives because, not because the Romans saw the movie Gladiator and they loved Marcus Aurelius, but because uh, they wrongly thought uh, it was Constantine or Constantine, the emperor who legalized Christianity, was known as the first Christian emperor, so nobody dared melting down Constantine. And then they found out it was Marcus Aurelius, but a thousand years later. So then uh, they were already proud of the statue and they did not try to recycle it for other things. And now uh, I'm just looking towards the city center uh, because I wanted to show you this beautiful dome here. Uh, so imagine now we have turned our back to the Capitol Hill and the bell tower. Uh, we are sort of Marcus Aurelius looking towards the river and that is the synagogue. We're going to uh, drive by or pass by the synagogue, the Jewish ghetto. Uh, which is still called like that because historically uh, the word ghetto itself uh, does not mean anything bad. It got bad connotations obviously because of the tremendous things that happened in the, in the history. But the word ghetto comes from Venetian getto, which meant foundry, where the first uh, um, Jewish community settled from Spain. And right next to the, to the ghetto, there's this amazing building that you see at the bottom uh, are the arches of ancient Roman theater. At the top is the medieval fortress, which is now well, some of the most expensive properties in Rome. But so that's how it looks like. And, and just a couple of Roman columns just for decoration here. Ah, just a couple. So that's what Rome offers, just such amazing combinations of different uh, historical styles and periods. Oh, hello, here's a fellow. Uh, this is ancient Roman Forum. And uh, uh, what happened is usually when we take kids around every time for things, they see a ruin, what happened? Uh, the time passing, the, uh, the period of the Middle Ages, uh, especially the Dark Ages, 6th and 7th century, and the population dropped to maybe 30,000 people from 1 million and 200,000. Nobody really cared about maintenance. And uh, um, the building material was recycled, uh, the drains get clogged, the flooding, silting, vegetation. So we end up with these ruins and a lot of excavations uh, have been done. I'm saying have been because they're still and always will excavate in Rome. At the far end, across the ruins of ancient Roman Forum is the Colosseum. And uh, the word forum is of uncertain origin. There are several theories and they're all equally boring. But what it came to mean is an open space where people come to discuss politics, to perform religious services. It's the center of social, political, and religious life in Rome. Of course, for the men. <laughs> we would have to complain today about that. But anyway, it was just for the Roman citizens as well, not just non-citizens. Non so that is ancient Roman form when Rome was founded on the uh, Palatine Hill then Romans basically were uh, a bunch of hooligans who started harassing their neighbors and they jump on the Capitol Hill and they kidnap, not to use other words, uh, the Sabines, the beautiful girls uh, of the Sabine tribe and uh, they slowly start expanding but not that slowly because they convinced everyone having problems with local authorities in the villages surrounding Rome to come and uh, uh, under their protection. So that's how they start, start spreading. But this is where um, in the sixth century BC in this valley, swampy valley in origin, uh, the Etruscan kings of Rome, these mysterious Etruscans, built the first big sewer, the drainage system, uh, Cloaca Maxima. And that's when it was possible to start building in this valley because they could land improvement, basically. Romans worked very hard on that. This is now also ancient Roman forum, but from the Palatine Hill. So now looking down to the right is the Colosseum, to the left is the seagull. 
and the Capitol Hill. So uh, we are looking again at the, at the ruins. This is an amazing building with the columns and the church. This was a temple from the second century turned into a, a Christian church in the Middle Ages and Roman Catholic later, obviously. And this is very typical to transform old ruins and temples uh, into uh, places of worship. The church in the Middle Ages became powerful also uh, because not just offering places for worship, but also offering social assistance to people. And then here, these huge arches are another basilica, uh, 4th century, known as Basilica of Constantine, although it was built by his predecessor. This is a fascinating temple of Antoninus and Faustina, converted into a uh, Roman Catholic church in the Forum Romanum, that's how we should call ancient Roman Forum. So now we went back to the Piazza Venezia, the square, and then turn to the right, as I promised, we're passing by the Trajan's Column. Uh, that is an amazing monument from the second century, uh, telling us the story. You see, there are these um, they're still coiling around. There are more than 2,000 little figures with individual facial features, telling us about how Trajan crossed the Danube with Roman troops, conquered nowadays Romania, and uh, uh, it literally means land of the Romans. There was a statue of Trajan at the top. Now this is St. Peter uh, that was placed on top of the column 500 years ago by the popes. And for a change of church, you know, there are hundreds of churches in Rome. Depends who's counting, but uh, really a huge number of churches. And the ruins, the columns are the ruins of the Trajan's Forum. Again, every emperor wanted to have this forum so he could feel more important. And uh, behind the columns, there is this uh, semicircular structure with identical uh, arches, windows. They call that uh, Trajan's Market probably the first shopping mall in the history of the world. And the medieval tower from the 13th century, just for the touch of medieval history. So now this is, uh, I love this photo, I took it. Uh, in a lovely rainy day, that became a sunny day. So we are heading towards the Colosseum uh, built. There we go, another view of the Colosseum now from the Roman, uh, Roman Forum. This buttress wall was built by the popes a couple of hundred years ago to support the crumbling structure. And uh, uh, this is the view of the, of the inside of the Colosseum today that also crumbled and uh, was scavenged and uh, uh, earthquakes in the olden times. So the first century when it was built in only about eight years uh, with the gold that was brought from Jerusalem, destruction of the Solomon's temple uh, and then the second and final destruction of the temple and then the gold used to finance the building of the Colosseum. Uh, where you see these people standing on this uh, platform, that's from the year 2000, the part of the arena was uh, rebuilt. And these would have been the tunnels under the arena where the show was prepared with animals, cages, uh, gladiators. Uh, there were different kinds of gladiators and categories, those who uh, would die to death. They were usually condemned. They were criminals, prisoners, uh, also Christians. Uh, uh, they were among the criminals because they uh, did not worship the emperor as a god. That was the most important uh, reason why they were persecuted. And then there were the gladiator stars uh, who were expensive and uh, like today, big wrestling league, you know, you don't kill horrible Hogan Hulk, you know, you need him for the next for the next show. And the seats would have been here where you see these like triangular walls. It's not easy to really imagine. Uh, this was the time when we were privileged enough to go up on the Belvedere and now due to the restoration, of course, before, even before COVID era, BC, before COVID, uh, we used to go to the Belvedere looking at those amazing ruins. We also used to go to the Colosseum Underground. It's very difficult now, very limited now. Who knows how things are going to develop and things will become possible again. But it has always been limited to uh, very few people to go to the underground because security and it's crumbling, it's not safe. I mean, crumbling, of course, it's safe for the part that's uh, made visitable. So just wanted to give you an idea to these pictures uh, when it was possible. Uh, Colosseum structure drawing. Uh, we see here those uh, vaults would actually support the seats because the arch supports the structure. Without the arch, it would be impossible in the old times to build anything solid. The system of entrances, 
80 entrances uh, uh, where people could enter only through that particular entrance for which they had uh, um, a little ticket, piece of the uh, bone or something with the Roman numeral on it. Up to 50,000 people. And Circus Maximus a few years ago, uh, there are the ruins of the Palatine Hill and uh, Circus Maximus, the, the valley for chariot races. It was a stadium for about 300,000 people. And uh, uh, chariot races were much more popular than the gladiator games uh, because uh, uh, the local teams that competed represented neighborhoods. And who can you hate more than your neighbor? So that was very, very passionate. So now from Circus Maximus that became farmland in the Middle Ages and now it's not allowed to build anything. It's, it's a monument, it's used for big public events. Uh, we pass by the great synagogue. We have the oldest Jewish community in Rome, in respect of Europe, obviously in the Middle East even because we have the first uh, Jewish uh, representatives of the um, uh, Judah de Maccabi, second century BC. And then slowly um, people came, Jewish um, community uh, from different parts of the, of the Middle East and especially Spain with the persecutions. Isabel, the Catholic queen said either conversion or death. And you may imagine that a lot of people chose exile. So we have a lot of Sephardic tradition. And uh, uh, the Jews were forced into a ghetto and with the walls so that don't exist anymore. Uh, in, the, in the 1500s with the Inquisition and everything. And uh, uh, eventually with uh, the ghettos um, uh, becoming illegal with the French Revolution, equality of all the people, uh, the ghetto in Rome was completely uh, demolished and rebuilt. And uh, the Great Synagogue was built in 1904. So the whole neighborhood, the actual ghetto does not exist anymore but there were the Roman ruins right next to the ghetto and the whole setting is really charming. And uh, if somebody told you today they lived in the ghetto, it would be like, wow, it's one of those very, very expensive, shabby chic neighborhoods. You see where we are now, we're looking at those three columns that we looked at from the Capitol Hill earlier. So now uh, this is the little bridge that connects the, uh, the bank of the Tiber where there is the ghetto uh, with the little island in the middle of the of the river, the Tiber Island, <clears throat> Ponte Fabricio. Uh, these crazy locks, you might have seen them everywhere. There's a kids who do that because they saw a movie where this love was locked forever, like two teenagers. They love each other as long as, uh, as it lasts. So the Pantheon. So I would like to show you something, the Pantheon. Let me see if I'll be smart enough to, to do that. Carolyn, you tell me if something is wrong. This is a little video, just two minutes, uh, where I explain Pantheon to a very handsome Paolo. Uh, who's American, uh, PBS did that. I work for Tauk. I hope I can still use the, the word um, work in the sense of verb <laughs> and tense. I have worked for Talc for more than 10 years. It's a great agency. And I also have private tours and all that. But Talc has been my major, major partner. And uh, uh, PBS did that for Talc. Olga, we're not seeing the video. <laughs> Mom, <Mama. laughs> we're hearing it, but you need to probably stop share and then share or. Okay, okay. They would like stop share. Let me see. Hello, everyone. Just one block away is a pantheon. So, we share to screen. Let me see. You're not seeing the videos, so... Here we are, in front of the Pantheon, the most There we go. We have in Rome, We're good now. A thousand good years old. Uh, it was built in the second century, and that's basically the only thing we know about it for certain. I learned that the Pantheon inspired some of the greatest Renaissance masters. And uh, this is where Brunelleschi, the Florentine architect, actually came to study the dome when he was preparing this project for the famous dome of the Duomo in Florence. And even Michelangelo, when he came here for the first time, he said this must have been built by angels. And talking about angels, the painter who was most famous for his beautiful chubby little angels and the Madonnas with the babies, Raphael. Uh, this is his tomb on that side. 
There were many important tombs in the Pantheon, but Raphael attracts most attention. Back outside, they take advantage of one of Rome's great resources. Water has always been free in Rome. That's what you do. <laughs> it is delicious. Water is one of the main reasons why Rome became what it became. You know, the abundance, cold. exactly. <laughs> Tu non mi guardi, io non resisto e continuo a cadere giù. Quando ti guardo, quasi sparisco dentro a quegli occhioni blu. Tu non mi guardi, tu non mi guardi, io non so respirare più. Quando ti guardo, quando ti guardo in tutto il mondo, ci sei solo tu. Okay, so let's Let me see, we're back to the PowerPoint. So that was just two minutes. I cut it out to over back to Kelly and help me cut it out in the video. Actually, Olga, we're still seeing us the still of the video, so I think you might have to stop share, do it again, da 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 da. Oh, okay. And, so, and you're doing great. There we go. Okay. So let me see. How about this? And then uh, share screen. How about now? Perfect. Good. Va benissimo. So, uh, when I did my first uh, tutorials, followed the tutorials about Zoom, and uh, this gentleman said, you're always going to have tech problems, actually, mine are own to my own ignorance. So, uh, so that's the Pantheon, 2,000 years old, with this amazing dome made of one piece of, of concrete, uh, pouring it into molds. I mean, Pantheon would deserve a tour uh, in itself. It was probably uh, dedicated to all the gods and became a church in the, in the 7th century. You can play with the light in the Pantheon. Uh, there are all kinds of phenomena happening in there. Then I promised Piazza Navona, the most beautiful square with lovely fountains, most famously uh, the one with the ancient Egyptian obelisk with the four river gods, designed by Bernini in the, in the 1600s. The Church of St. Agnes, which was absolutely stunning. Uh, square with Piazza Navona, always full uh, street artists uh, as well. And then we cross the river, uh, remember Trastevere, across the Tiber. There is a beautiful basilica, uh, basilica meaning originally um, a public courthouse from Greek Basileo, the king, and later it became a title of the Catholic Church. So Basilica of Santa Maria in Trastevere, Mary in Trastevere, medieval. Basilica, here is the square, the main square. This is what I mean by shabby chic. These are cred incredibly expensive apartments because inside they're just gorgeous. They could be mixed also with our very poor families that just refuse to sell. And if they sold, they would make a lot of money. This is the inside of the basilica with ancient Roman columns and the um, uh, Baroque ceiling. It's just a, an amazing combination of uh, medieval mosaics in the apse, uh, just one of the most stunning churches in Rome. This is how the streets look like. It's the only neighborhood where it's still allowed to uh, dry the laundry outside. It's not allowed in the city otherwise. And now we're up on the Gianicolo Hill, passing by the beautiful fountain, Il Fontanone in Roman dialect, the big fountain, celebrating the Roman aqueduct. And here were two symbols of Italy, Garibaldi, uh, the leader of the military operations uh, during the unification movement, we're talking about 1860s. And then the little Cinquecento, 500, the Fiat, the national car, the national monument as well, like, in, uh, like tangible heritage, uh, however, national, national monument itself. And this is the panorama. So you see uh, now the lady who asked me about the monument, here it is. Uh, it's like a fist in the eye, architecturally and politically, but we are getting used to it. Uh, it's just a local joke. 
about the, the monument. It's actually really stunning. And uh, the Colosseum is to the right. Uh, and here is the Quirinale Hill. The Trevi Fountain is in the very center. You go to the left and you see the dome of the Pantheon. And then we go down to the Vatican City State. Just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, the Vatican City State, the smallest state in the world, 110 um, acres. And here is St. Peter's Basilica with the St. Peter's Square. Here are the museums, Vatican museums, and the Sistine Chapel. It's right here next to the St. Peter's uh, Basilica. It looks tiny, but it's dwarfed by the enormous St. Peter's. And uh, uh, the current Pope doesn't really live uh, uh, in the building right above the square. Francesco chose to live here. Uh, closer to the bottom of the of the map on our screen where there is a residential area so he likes company for breakfast I guess and it was quite lonely in his apartment uh, right above the square and these are the Vatican Gardens here uh, to the left so the Pope got the state in 1929 and uh, uh, it was result of the negotiations between the, the King, Savoy King, Mussolini and the, and the Pope. So here is the St. Peter's Basilica with the famous dome. Here is the Sistine Chapel. This tiny little roof here is the Sistine Chapel, the beautiful, beautiful St. Peter's uh, uh, Square. Designed uh, by Bernini. Now we are in the 1600s. He imagined that uh, the facade of the basilica were like the shoulders of God, dome was the head of God. So he added two huge arms to embrace the pilgrims as they come to St. Peter's tomb. Where Pope normally lives is this building uh, to the right, which now looks different. This is the version from older times. But uh, let's say that it's got new facade. But anyway, the papal apartments are here at the, at the corner. And this is a view of St. Peter's Dome from the Vatican Museums. And this is St. Peter's Basilica inside with the famous Baldacchino designed by uh, Bernini again. So we have jumped one century from uh, Michelangelo, the dome from inside. And now we are uh, getting farther away from the Basilica and this fortress here to the right, that's Castel Sant'Angelo. Uh, that originally was built in the in the second century by Emperor Hadrian as the mausoleum, the burial site of the imperial family. You see how the bottom looks older because, well, it is. And uh, it was all lined with marble, but of course all of that is long gone because uh, people in power, including the popes and the local barons, are just chopping off whatever they, they liked. But uh, the building became a stronghold, the shelter during the barbarian invasions, later on the papal stronghold. But the legend goes, you see here at the, at the top of Castel Sant'Angelo, there is a statue of Archangel Michael. In the sixth century, there was this tremendous plague that contributed to uh, the diminishing of the population a lot. Uh, it killed so many people in Rome that they lost count. It's known as Justinian plague. It probably also uh, com coincided with the change in climate due to some volcanic eruptions at that time, judging from the layers of ice in the glaciers, there was some kind of volcanic eruption, plague, and the Pope was desperate. So he was praying, praying, praying for an intervention, and he was walking by the castle, and uh, the story goes, all of a sudden, Archangel Michael comes out, and he unsheaths his sword, and guess what? The plague stopped. So ever since, we've always had a statue of Archangel uh, Michael on top of the, of the castle, which is now a museum. It's an amazing museum. And uh, uh, I hope Archangel Michael will have some kind of a solution for this current situation as well. He's expert in uh, uh, these strange periods of diseases. So please, Archangel Michael, save us again. So, um, well, I have sort of wrapped up, uh, trying to remain within, it's not really 45, I did 53 minutes. I hope it wasn't, it wasn't too much. And uh, uh, I would be happy to answer any, any questions if you have any. And please, if you remember anything, you can always be in touch through Carolyn through, and ask me later any, any time. Yeah. Olga, thank you. Can you um, stop sharing your screen and then we can see folks and then if anybody wants to comment or have questions, great. Okay. 
All right, so I just like hearing your voice, Olga, but I see there's something in the chat. Let's see. Um, thank you so much. Appreciate the opportunity from Janet. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for joining us. And um, you can just unmute yourself if you have a question. And I know there's somebody on the phone that I kept muting. Let me see if I can unmute them. Where is the Appian Way in the context? Uh, uh, it goes from the um, Circus Maximus towards south. So imagine if Rome is in the center of the peninsula towards the Tyrrhenian Sea, towards west to the Mediterranean, going south from the Circus Maximus. It was the oldest uh, ancient Roman road built in the fourth century uh, uh, BC. And uh, ever since, Romans built uh, roads starting from a zero point, zero mile in ancient Roman Forum. Ancient Appian Road is an exception because it was the first one and it started from the Circus Maximus, went south, and then uh, it split uh, between two harbors that were strategically important uh, in, the, in the south. It's an amazing archeological site today. It's possible to walk. There was a few miles where you can walk on ancient Roman uh, basalt blocks. And there are tombs, mausoleums, churches, and ruins, villas. Let's see. Oh, COVID canceled some uh, Carol's trip to Rome in September, so she was glad to see it virtually. Um, from Bruce, he says, uh, if we were there in Rome, how long would this tour take? Uh, this, the tour that I did is a bit of a combination of something that can be done. I normally work with the drivers uh, because only with the driver it's possible to cover so many spots. So to do all of this, it could be a full day. It's, it's easily, easily a really full day without counting, let's say, going inside the Colosseum or inside the Vatican Museums. So it could be a day and a half, but you see the, for example, when like private visits are organized, they're organized to fit the needs and desires. And I'm not selling anything. I'm just telling you how, <laughs> how it works. Um, well, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I will. but uh, no, that's not the point. But uh, the, the private tours are meant to uh, satisfy your needs. Okay, I have three hours of either uh, attention span or budget. Okay. So in three hours, we can do this, this, and this. If we don't take the driver, we can do this and that. If we take the driver, we can do pum, pum, pum. When people are on a budget, uh, then uh, I always recommend at least three hours with the driver because you can hit these viewpoints. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's really strenuous to, to walk around Rome. And of course, with bigger groups, talk, uh, we used to work with big buses. Now, how it's going to be in the future, uh, I don't know. My talk tours have been canceled basically for, for this year. But maybe something wakes up towards the new year, hopefully, but we'll see. And uh, so the big buses, uh, where we have groups from 20 to 40 people, the buses are limited. So if you want to see Spanish Steps, Trevi Fountain, Piazza Navona, Pantheon, you have to walk. But if you are with a private driver for two, three, four people, then you can have a van, a car, a limo. So it, there are all, all kinds of possibilities. There are all kinds of possibilities, and it's always adapted to the desires, budget, needs, I always give options and if people say, okay, I like this, but I uh, cannot afford this or that, then I always send links uh, to, uh, like, let's say I have colleagues who have agencies who organize smaller groups, which are much more affordable. There's all kinds of, of stuff to, to please everyone. Or suggestions, do on your own, yeah. and then I would be happy to provide suggestions regardless. Um, a couple of uh, more things. Let's see. Thank you, Olga. A wonderful trip. Uh, I enjoyed my visit to Rome in the 80s, but could not remember how I went from one place to the next. You just made things all connected. So that was, that was wonderful. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Rome is so beautiful and amazing. Your explanations and descriptions are wonderful. I agree. Are there still cats in the Colosseum? No, it's been some years now, if not even 15 years. Uh, cat, and the cats uh, used to be the Roman Forum and the Colosseum. And you know how people are, they just bring the litter. Oops, another six. Oops, another 16. <sighs> so uh, for hygienic reasons, sanitary reasons, they have banned that. There is still a cat sanctuary in a square called Torre Argentina, 
uh, break it down into the ruins. Uh, and there is a group of volunteers uh, who uh, take care of the um, group of maybe a dozen up to 20 older handicapped cats. And uh, people can go, uh, people do go. You buy their little souvenirs to help finance, but they strongly discourage their signs, please do not bring your litters because we'll be forced to send them somewhere else. So no. Oh, there are two cats. I have a picture. Uh, there's, there are two cats who live in the Colosseum. And uh, uh, one is black with a little white here, and he's like a feral cat. So you can kind of pat him a little bit and then he's like me. So nobody really touches him. We call him Nerone. Nerone uh, is like Nero, the emperor, but Nero means black in Italian. So that's why he's Nerone. He's black, but he's the emperor. And every once in a while, Nerone comes out and we take, all take pictures of him between the colleagues. Nerone is back, you know, and then there is one more who rarely shows up. So there are two cats in the Colosseum, yes. <laughs> and Nerone is famous. That's great. Let's see, Mary, did you have a question or comment? I see you're unmuted. Mary Barnaby. Yes, yes. I was wondering in one of the very first photos, why did they build two churches side by side? Oh, uh, you mean the, um, the, the, the Northern Gate? For, yeah. symmetry. For symmetry, because imagine that, that huge square uh, has always been there in this, some way, you know, it's Northern Gate. And when the Pope in the 1500s uh, urbanistically reorganized that part, uh, the intention was to impress the pilgrims coming from the north, because now very few people were coming from the south. The Mediterranean is in chaos and there was Middle Ages, just the end of the Middle Ages, so there's no regular influx from the south. So we have to impress people coming from the north. And how do we impress them? Boom, obelisk, symmetry, Great Street, trident. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a show off a little bit, but it's okay. a show off. <laughs> Thank and you. Symmetry is half of the beauty. Okay, thank you very much. And I've been on a few tap tours, they're excellent. They are, they are. Excellent. I'm proud to work with them. Actually that PBS, you know, uh, if anybody wants to, through Caroline again, I have the link to the whole video, which is 15 minutes from Tuscany to Rome, and mine are only two minutes of glory. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is the best part, Olga, but yes, yes. I'm happy well, to share that too. Love the Piazza <laughs> with the whole, whole team. That was great. Olga, thank you so much. It's just a pleasure to see your face and all the wonderful way you express stuff. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Clay. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. I so love to share my uh, love for Rome. I can say knowledge because knowledge is just so arrogant to say because there's so much for like three lifetimes to, to study. So it's love. <laughs>